then today we are going to add in a staircase. We're gonna add in some railings. We can play around with some of the features of like how to define some of the things in materials. We'll add in some components, which are things for like our bathrooms and our kitchens. There's also some furniture too that we can add in. And then we'll put in a site as well. Sites can sometimes be a little bit tricky, um, especially with the new version of sites. Um, the more I play around with it, the better I'm getting at it, but it has a slight little learning curve to the new version. And then we'll see, I don't think we'll be able to do anything in Enscape, unfortunately, but we will absolutely be able to just run a rendering within Revit's native render kind of format. And that's a little bit better than nothing. So first thing then is let's make sure we've got our file open and ready to go. And then we are going to add a staircase because at the moment we have level one, we have level two, we have no way to get up to this upper level of the building. Um, so we got to add in a stairs. It always makes the most sense to me to add stairs from the lowest level going then up to the next one. You could absolutely start your staircase on the upper level, go into the ground, and then say it's starting at the ground, but that kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'm gonna go into my ground floor plan. Since I never closed my files since yesterday, I still have all of my tabs up here. You most likely don't, because you closed out, opened it back up, which means you'd only have whatever current view you're looking at. So then you have to go into your project browser double click on ground so that way you are now in the ground floor floor plan to add a staircase we're going to use the button stair up at the top so the one that is the staircase um, when i go into a staircase it's going to open up the same menu like it does with a floor and like it does with a roof where i have to first kind of create it or draw out what I want my stair to look like. And then I either need to say, please make my stair or never mind, I need to figure something out. There are a few different options for stairs. We can do just a straight run of stairs. Um, we can also though put little landings in between this. So if I do need to make like a switchback set of stairs, which we'll do in our commercial project, we can do that with just the plain straight ones. We can do a spiral staircase where it's going to be a full circle spiral. We can also do a staircase in which it's going to just have a curve to it if we ever need to do something where it's just gonna be a curved staircase. And then we have two winder options where we can either do an L-shaped winder or a U-shaped winder. So winders just don't have a landing sitting in them. Um, I love winder staircases. You don't see them a lot in houses anymore. They were in older houses quite a bit. Um, these two work a little differently in that if I wanted to use the staircase, it kind of just plops it in and then I have to move it around. These ones we get to kind of place where we want each step to go within it. If I'm not mistaken, winder staircases and circular staircases are a little ABA. Non They're definitely non-compliant. I lived in an old house that had a U-winder staircase, and especially as a college house, was not safe for, <laughs> for some of us to be walking around. Maybe if we had a little too many iced teas that night, it was a little not great. But it was so cute. It was beautiful. Um, in this house, we're just going to do a straight run staircase, so I'm going to make sure I'm on the straight option. Um, base level is going to be our ground floor, and we want this to go up to the upper level floor, so it's already set with that. And Revit is making an assumption here that we want 18 steps to go up. If I wanted more steps, I could play around with that number. So if I say that I want 20 steps, we'll also see here that that riser height has changed and moved around. Realistically, 18 steps would work just fine. I switched mine to 20. I'll switch it back to 18, so that way if it makes you guys happy um, with that. And it's just estimating how tall each one of these steps are going to be. What you want to pay attention to in a lot of scenarios is that you're just not making this number too high. 
if you're going to have steps that are one foot each tread height or each riser height, that's no one's going to like that stair, especially like as an interior one. Then I'm going to place where I want my stair to start. So I'm just going to click here to start it. And then Revit's going to count out how many steps that it's made as you kind of move your cursor along. And then once you're all done, it says that I've made 18, I have zero remaining, so I can click again and I have a staircase placed. If I don't like where my staircase is, I can click on it and I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard to kind of move it around. So we are just gonna have, gonna have ours floating here. Particularly one thing we're gonna have to pay attention to is once we go up to the upper level, we wanna make sure that this is stopping in a good spot because it's very often that like it fits really nice on our first floor, but then on the second floor, it's like just jetting into a wall. Um, if I wanted to change things like my overall width of my steps, so right now it made a three foot wide staircase. That's a great size, but I can easily click on that witness line and I can change my steps to be a little bit wider or less depending on what I want. And once I like my staircase, I'm just gonna come up here and hit the green check to say, cool, please finish my steps. And now I have a staircase in there. Revit has adjusted the way these stairs look based on architectural standards. So that's why we have some solid lines going on here and then dash ones here. Because if you think back to like the very beginning of the course, where I it's talked about how the floor plan cut is four foot above the height of the floor. And so therefore, this break is about at where the stairs would go up four feet. If I go into my upper level plan, so I'm just going to double click on it here, I can see my staircase. It's not terminating in like a bad spot necessarily. I have plenty of floor up here. But the issue that we are gonna face is if I go look at the building 3D and I go creep through this window, my floor, I have a giant floor sitting in the middle of this staircase. So that's not ideal in any way, shape or form because I can't actually get up into the floor. My hope is one day eventually they're going to even like speed up that process of if you've placed a stair, they automatically put kind of like a gap or an opening but until then, we're going to have to add that gap or opening ourselves. So I'm going to go into my upper level floor plan again, and I'm going to select my floor, which I could do that by just clicking on the edge of it right here. Since I have this little bit of balcony, I can easily just be able to select that floor edge. Or one other way I can do it, because sometimes it is hard, sometimes we don't have that balcony, is if I do like a click and drag over here, right now I've selected three different objects. And I know that because my filter down here says I have three things selected. So if I click on this filter, or if I click on this filter, these two buttons are the exact same thing. This one is just always present on the screen. It's telling me that I have a floor and two walls selected. So I could just say, don't select the walls, I only want the floor and now I have the floor, only the floor selected. In this scenario, we could just click on the edge of it there and get it, but oftentimes we don't have a visible edge to the floor. Once I have the floor selected, then I'm going to come up here and modify it. So I want to edit its boundary, and I'm just gonna draw a rectangle or a box around where my staircase is. So I'm going to say that I want a rectangle and I'm just going to, I'm going to make an opening for the whole staircase. Realistically, you could probably have like still floor space here because think about it while you're traveling up the stairs. Like if I'm standing on the stair here, depending on how, if our building is 10 foot tall and the step is like at three foot height here, I'm not going to hit my head on the ceiling necessarily but I'm just gonna make it a whole big space. And then I'm going and then I'm gonna hit the green check. 
And again, it's asking me, do you want to attach these floors to their bottoms? I am going to click on attach. And now when I go into my 3D view, I have a nice hole where my staircase is. However, I have now a slightly different problem with this hole. And that is, this isn't necessarily a kid-friendly house to begin with, but that's super not kid-friendly. That's also just not like normal person-friendly. This is a bad idea to just have this big old space here. So I need to add in some railing around that so that this way, it's going to say if a cat falls down there, it'll be tragic, but the cat will be fine. If a dog falls down there, that would be tragic. And I guess maybe someone's kid, but like... So I'm going to go back into my upper level plan. And what I want to do is add in a railing. They already put a railing in on the steps by default. We can adjust that railing. We can delete it too if we want. So if we want a floating stair look. Um, additionally, like if you put stairs right on the edge of walls, it will put railings on both sides. You really don't necessarily need the railing on the side that's on the wall. Um, but we are going to draw in our own railing. So that's the button near the stair where I'm gonna do a railing. I'm gonna offset my railing by about three inches, two and a half inches, so that this way I can just draw around the staircase, but have that railing then at least installed on the floor here. So I'm gonna give it an offset of like three inches. So I'll just do three, enter. And then I'm actually, instead of using the line tool to draw it, which I absolutely could do, I'm gonna use this pick line option here to just say, I wanna put a railing on that side, I wanna put a railing on this side, and I wanna put a railing on this side. Now, when you do a railing, one thing is that it has to be one continuous line or one continuous path. And this is not one continuous path. So I need to bring these corners to meet each other. Two ways I could do it, one would be I hit escape like 14 times and then I can click on these blue grips and I can move these out to meet. The other way I could do it is using the little shortcut here for the trim and extend corners. So that's either keyboard shortcut TR or this button here and I could click on two lines and it'll just bring them to a corner. Um, this would be my preferred method. The other way though works just as well. So whichever one you use, I don't mind. If I wanted to change the railing type, I can do that right here in the properties bar. So there's a couple of them in here by default. I'm just gonna leave it as this handrail rectangular because that's what the staircase already has. And so I kind of want them to match. And then if I go look at it three dimensionally, I have that railing over there. I've got this ugly little gap here between the two of them. I'm just gonna leave it be. I know it's not nice, but I'm just gonna leave it. Okay. Knuckle eh, it's kind of weird, but it's just weird to but look have at. Have you ever been in a staircase where you like so tight that your knuckles? Eh. Well, if Ingrid says it's okay, then we're definitely gonna leave it. Um, one thing too, looking at it three dimensionally here is we do have like a couple of things in our way that would be like nicer if they weren't here. Like if we could just look into this building without having to creep it in this window, that'd be pretty cool. But like the fact that this roof is here is a little bit of a bother. So two ways we can temporarily like get rid of things is one is to use this little hidden and the isolate as well. So I can click on this roof here and then I can click on the glasses and I can say hide element or I could hide a category. So if I click on hide element, what it does is it just hides that roof so that this way I can look at the building without the roof in there. 
If I was to do a hide category, so if I wanted to click on this window, I could then click on my glasses and say hide category gets rid of everything in that category. Why would I want to get rid of all of my windows at the time? I don't know, but I could. Um, so category hides everything in that category, in that plan. That I don't know a better way to describe the word category. <laughs> Um, element just hides that one particular piece. Once you have gotten rid of the roof and are able to like look at your floor or under, get to the part that you need a little bit better, you can then come down here and click on the glasses and you can reset it so that way everything's back. So the hide feature or the isolate feature, the temporary hide isolate, just gets rid of it for the time being, but it doesn't delete it. Another option, and kind of my preferred option when I'm in a 3D view, is what's called the section box. So while I'm in the 3D view and I have nothing selected, so I could just spam the escape key a bunch of times, if I scroll down about halfway, I can turn on what's called the section box. And when I turn the section box on, this floating box appears around my building. And what this allows me to do is I can click on that box and I can move these arrows in or out to just slice parts of my building away. So if I wanted to look at my first floor, I could just go through and keep slicing through until eventually I'm just only looking at my first floor. Um, I really like the section box. It's one of my favorite things in the 3D view. You can also get some really cool like renderings from like cutting open sections like this and understand a little bit too about um, how daylighting is gonna affect interiors when you are looking at it through the section box. And then you can of course to turn the section box off if you ever need to. And so that's how in this document here, that's how I took all of these little screenshots of the building was I just kept cutting it open at different levels so we could see kind of the different parts and different pieces. We've got our stairs. We need to also add in another railing on here on our little deck because since I turned this panel into a door, this is not going to be a very safe deck. That would be kind of cool to sit there with my legs sitting off of it, but I'm going to think a little more about safety. So I'm going to go into my upper level and I'm going to make another railing just right here on this edge. So I'm going to go into the railing tool. I could use pick lines again, or I could just draw one in manually. I am going to do another offset of like three inches. And then, since I did an offset, I can just draw it straight on this edge because it'll just bring it in three. Or, if I hit escape a bunch of times and I delete that, when I go to do the railing, I can use pick line and I can do an offset of three and then just pick which side I want. I want to bring it in three, not out three. It is right now inside those walls. That's not great. I don't want it to do that. So I'm going to pull those grips in. And then I can say, cool, make my railing. And if I look at it three dimensionally, I have this railing here. You can also change the railing style after the fact. So if I don't like the way this railing looks, I can click on it and I could come into the properties. And like maybe for this one, I want this glass fill to look a little bit more like nicer. I kind of like the guardrail pipe. I think that it's stylized enough, at least for the outside. The other ones kind of look a little weird. There's not that many, but there's some. We got new tables last year and they 
I begged everyone, please don't cut them. And they still, they were cutting on the table. Don't cut on a table, get a cutting mat. <laughs> All right. So. Well, I had a very long time ago, I had a drafting table where it had one of those green covers that you could replace. And so I did cut on that. But then I got rid of that table. Shouldn't have gotten rid of it. It was a nice table. No, I had a five foot hydraulic one. It was more I just didn't want to take it on a move. Because <laughs> it was so annoying to move around. Um, next, we're going to add in some components to our building. So that's going to be things like our, we'll do a couple of pieces of furniture. We'll put a toilet in that weird little bathroom we made um, just to get a feel for how the component tool works. So components are basically anything that doesn't have its own isolated button related to it. Um, you can place components in any view. You could do it in an elevation, a floor plan, a you can do it in the 3D view. I don't recommend it, but that's how a lot of students like to place them. I like to do them in a floor plan view. So if I want to place like a toilet and a sink in this room, I'm gonna go into my ground floor floor plan and I'm going to come up here to the component button up in the top corner or keyboard shortcut CM. There are very few components loaded into a project by default. So if I click on here to look at all of the different components that are loaded in while I'm in the tool, we have a couple of desks. We have a few trees. We have picture frames, which are really weird, um, which you can find JPEGs and you can put them in the picture frames too. If you wanna get that level of detail, we're not getting that level of detail. Um, but since there's so few things loaded in by default, what we're gonna do is come up here to load family. So that way we can load in different components. Again, since I haven't closed my project since the last time I used it, it brought me into the very last folder I was ever in, which was doors. To get back to all of the different components, I'm gonna come up here to look in and I'm gonna go into the English Imperial folder. That is gonna bring me back to where all of the stuff is. A couple of tips for some of these folders. If you're looking for cabinetry or shelves, they're gonna be in casework. If you're looking for kitchen stuff, this is a really weird one. Kitchen stuff is in specialty equipment. I wouldn't consider a fridge something special, but according to Revit, having a fridge is pretty special. So now I feel so blessed that I have a fridge. Um, Plumbing is where we'll find a lot of our bathroom stuff. Eventually, the more you use Revit, the more you are gonna memorize where some of the stuff is in like these folders. A lot of the furniture stuff is in furniture. Entourage has a bunch of like really weird things in it. You can get a pulpit in there if you want. But we're gonna get a toilet first. So I'm gonna go into the plumbing folder. I'm gonna double click on plumbing. There's two folders in here. There's the architectural and there's MEP. If we use stuff from MEP, we can actually even like put together like a whole mechanical, electrical and plumbing plan. So we could figure out where pipes are gonna be placed and we can even then do some water flow calculations and everything. I have not used any of the plumbing features within Revit, so I can't really say how well they work. I'm sure they work well, but I don't know how to use them. I've done a little bit with like trying to do some HVAC stuff and some electrical stuff, but we're just gonna get the pieces out of the architectural folder. What these are gonna do is they're gonna symbolize, hey, there's a toilet here, but they're not going to be something that we can figure out how much water is that toilet gonna use in a typical year. So I'm gonna go into the architectural one. In here, I'm gonna go into the architectural fixtures and then we have a couple of different categories. We've got bathtub strains, shower sinks, urinals. Water closet is the weird architectural word for toilet. So if I go into water closet, 
We have a commercial toilet and we just have a domestic toilet. It's nothing beautiful, but it's going to get our point across and that's really just all we need. Um, the 2D one will work just fine. It's just only never gonna show up in like your 3D model or anything. So as a forewarning, I always use the 3D models. And then I'll click on open. And now I have a toilet. If I wanna flip which way the toilet's facing, I can use the space bar to spin it or flip it around. And then I can place my toilet. If I wanna place like a sink now, I just would have to come back up into load family I'd have to go back in my folders. I don't necessarily have to go all the way back to English Imperial. I can just put myself back like into fixtures and now I can go into the sink folder. Do they have a van? They do have some vanity sinks. These need to sit within a cabinet though. They don't have, I think they don't have just a standalone freestanding sink, which is a little bit of a bummer. So, one thing we could do is we could go find a pedestal sink to go put in here. So if I'm looking for something and I can't find it within any of these folders, I can go on the internet and I can search for Revit pedestal sink, which looks like I'm not alone. Someone was also looking for it and someone was looking for a pedicure chair. Um, Couple of places you can find some really good stuff. Um, Revit City is a great resource. You do have to make an account to use Revit City. It is free to make an account. So I'm just gonna open up Revit City here. BIMObject.com is also another huge one. BIM Object was purchased by Autodesk, so they now own this website. Um, and so, you do also have to make an account to download anything from BIM Object, but it is also free to make an account with them. So this is a sink that they've led me to. I can even then say like, maybe I don't like this pedestal sink, so I'll just go back into all bathroom sinks and find the sink of my dreams. These ones are ones that people have made and put up online, similar to like the models within the 3D warehouse. Maybe some of them are good, maybe some of them aren't. BIM Object is now kind of my go-to. I used to rely mostly on Revit City, but BIM Object is the one I rely on more, especially because this one has models from manufacturers on it. So like, if this is the sink I know I wanna use, I can even then spec out pricing and everything for it. And so I'm gonna say I wanna download this. I'm just gonna sign in with Google because I know I have an account with them. Apparently, I, maybe I just have an account with my other Google. I know I have an account. Hello? Maybe if I do my sign in with Autodesk. There we go, okay. That was a little weird. Let me come back up here and search for pedestal sink. Is that how you spell pedestal? I think so. It might help if I put an L there. Or is it an I here? I'm not a speller either. Well, I've got enough options that I can just pick one. I'll say this is the one I want. So I'm going to say that I want to download its Revit file. And if I'm downloading something from the internet, then I'm just going to open it up in Revit. So I've taken it from Revit. Right now it's saying, this sink was made in 2015. You're using Revit 2023. So I'm gonna say that I wanna upgrade it. It's gonna open it up as a separate file. 
And then I'm going to say I want to load it into my project and close out of this file. And now I have, why is it loading in like that? There we go. I don't know why they, why would I want it on that face? And now I have my sync here. I could potentially have my sync backwards. So I'm going to go into my 3D view. Why is it allowing me to do that? <laughs> it's how the person modeled it. And I'm going to just cut my building open until I can see my first floor. Because If I have my sink backwards, I happened to not place it backwards. That was purely just by coincidence and luck. Because since the way they modeled it was only just a square, I couldn't see. But I can then click on it and I can rotate it. So if I had it model, put it in back, or if I had put it in backwards, then I can just use this rotate feature to spin it around. Or I could also use the space bar to spin it around. Sometimes finding components on the internet to put into your model is a little bit of guesswork. Sometimes you find what you think is going to be the best component, and then when you go to load it in, you're like, I actually don't like it not working, it's not what I want. Um, you can model your own components, but it takes a lot of practice to get really good at modeling your own um, pieces and your own families. We also have the ability here, if I click on the little arrow under component, where I can model something in place. And we're gonna do that in our commercial project. We're just gonna put in this little kind of awning or shade on our windows. It's gonna be a pretty simple piece that we can then just model ourselves um, where we can kind of like sketch up, draw out a face, pull it up, or like how I showed a few days ago within the Sears house, chimneys don't exist within Revit, so I kind of modeled my own chimney and just made my own as I was going. Um, if I wanted to, sure, Revit, I'll save. If I wanted to put in other pieces, again, I would come up to load family. And then I could go back into my English Imperial folder and I could start adding kind of any different part or piece that I want to. If I wanted to just put in very basic furniture, if I go into the furniture folder, there's a couple of things that we can put in. Within seating, they've expanded it a little bit. They used to just be a lot of really ugly things. They've put in at least some stylized pieces, which is cool. But for the most part, like the sofas aren't really all that cool to look at. But this still could help me figure out, do I have enough room for this living room to actually work or be a functional living room? Do I have enough room for a dining room table in this area? Um, so we can just start adding in different parts or different pieces. So component is anything that isn't the building itself. My beautiful, beautiful chair. My just one singular sofa in my weird building. So the next thing that I'd like to do is add in a site to this building. So just to add in some kind of like grass or features sitting around it. The, there are a couple of different ways you can add a site or rather a couple of different views you could do a site in. I usually do it in the three dimensional view is where I usually go to place my site. So I'm going to go into my 3D view. I could click on its tab here, or I could click on the little default. And before I go place my site, I want to look at it straight from the top. So I want to look at it head on, or plan on rather, not head on. 
because otherwise, often if I'm looking at it after I've orbited around a little bit, I might think I'm placing points in certain spots, but in reality, I'm not. So that's why I like to come up to this view cube and click on the top. Okay. Then to get into creating a site, we need to go into the massing and site tab. Within massing and site, we have this tool called Topo Surface. This tool no longer exists within Revit 2024. They have changed it from a topo surface to a topo solid. And it works a little bit differently when you're working with the solid. Um, but we're going to make a surface. So I'm going to click on topo surface. And we'll see when we go into this tool, our toolbar changes again, just like it did with a floor, where now, though, we are placing points of elevation. And we also have this option to create a piece of topography from an import. So this was what I was talking about from SketchUp, where I could find the terrain in SketchUp. I can export it as an AutoCAD DWG file. I can then import it into Revit, and I can have my piece of land pretty much built out for me with all of my points. Or if I'm getting data from a land surveyor, I can load it in as a CSV, which is kind of like an Excel sheet, and then I can have my piece of land from there. As the architect, yes, you'll be doing site visits. You could even then potentially have like a couple of drone videos of kind of get the idea of the piece of land you're working with, but you are not going to be building necessarily everything from scratch. Hopefully you'll have something to work from. Even then, though, we can just build our own piece of land by just placing points and adjusting their elevations of the heights. So our building itself, our level one, is sitting at zero, or our ground level sitting at zero, zero, and then everything else is based off of that. We're not doing things based off of, like, sea level elevation when we're placing these points. Though we can, if we wanted to, we can then start to define things based on sea level, but we're not going to. We change the elevation heights here. So if we wanted something to go down into a valley, we would start making these numbers negative. If we wanted it to go up into a hill, we would make these numbers positive. The way it works in the topo solid in the new feature is essentially you draw your property line or your overall boundary, and then you can place different elevation points within there. So it works kind of like you're making a floor but you're making a floor out of the dirt. It's, it's better, but I'm still, it's got a little bit of a learning curve to it. Um, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to place a couple of elevation points. I'm going to make like a building where I've got like a flat area here and then a hill sort of building up. So I'm just going to say that I want an elevation point of zero here, here, and here. Once you place three points, it will start to build out a piece of land. Then I'm just gonna change my elevation height just by like an inch. So I'm just gonna change it one inch and I'm gonna place another point here, here, and here. And if I start to orbit around, we can see now that I've got a big patch of dirt on my house. I'm gonna go back into my top. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's why we also can't really see it. Like if I go look at it straight from the left, you can see the tiniest little bit of slope upward here. But we'll say that I've graded this area pretty well. <laughs> Let me look at it back from the top. And I like to, I just like to have this kind of oriented if I change this number to be like three feet now, well, that's three inches, Dinah, and I start placing, it's also going to start adding in topography lines for me. So now I have like a three foot slope going up here. 
And then if I make like a 10 foot elevation, like right here, we'll see too that those topo lines got real packed because I went a seven foot up in a pretty small amount of distance. And so we can even then see that hill starting to take shape a little bit. Um, when you're building out topography on your own, what I usually do is I sort of kind of build up a grid of these dots and then go and alter them or change them around. You can also, if I hit escape a bunch of times, I can drag these dots around if I want to. So if I wanted a bigger piece of land or a smaller piece of land, I can do that. Once I'm all done with my site, I've got to hit the green check mark to make it. If I want to adjust anything about it, I can click on it and I can edit its surface. So I can adjust these points or change these points. None of them are stuck exactly where they are. If I wanted to adjust the topography lines and how they are shown, and this is, I let me see if I do absolutely remember it. Or is it this little arrow? Yeah, it's this little arrow right here. I was going to go into the wrong thing. This little arrow right next to the word model site, um, it's showing contour lines at 10 foot. If I change it to say, like, give me a topography line at every one foot, or maybe that's not going to change anything. Hmm. And maybe it is in manage. I thought it was in manage in here. But if I'm wrong, I'm not going to sit and waste your time. What if I make this every one inch? That would be obnoxious, but there we go. Okay, so it is in there. But no one would want topography lines every one inch. I can change when those topography lines show up, how often that they're going to be there. Um, but I have two kind of small problems with now my site. One of them is that I've now filled my entire house with dirt. And I've covered in this piece of floor that I have here. And the other is that my site is just a giant piece of dirt, and most likely that's not what we're going to have in our end result for our house. So to fix the fact that it's just one giant piece of dirt, we're going to click on it, and then we can edit its material. So up here in the properties bar, we have a material, and I can click on where it says by category, and then this little dot, dot, dot button pops up. I can open that up and let me just make mine look a little bit more like yours probably looks the first time you open it. And I can choose from categories of things that are already loaded into this project. I can search up at the top and see if there's any grass. Which when I search for grass, nothing is here in this project. So what I have to do instead is open up the material library down here. And if it's really small when you first open it up, you can drag that up to expand it. I usually also will have this open. And then I can take this file here for grass and I can load it into my project. So I've now made grass something that I can use. One thing I like to do with all of my materials is I like to go into this graphics tab here on the side and I like to check off use render appearance. So that way, when I'm here in conceptual colors, I get a visual cue that I have a material applied there. The other problem of the fact that my entire inside of my house now has been turfed can be solved with what's called a building pad. Building pads no longer exist in the 2024 version. 
Um, but what a building pad essentially is doing is it's just excavating the land out of whatever area you have drawn. So I'm gonna make a building pad. So I'm gonna click on building pad. I'm gonna use the pick lines option and I'm gonna make a building pad just around the big deck floor that I made on level one. So I'm gonna X out of that and I'll just show it again. Oh, quitting. Yes, please quit. So I came up here to building pad. I'm going to say that I want to pick the lines that are associated with my building pad. One, two, three, four. And then where do I want the building pad to sit? Right now, it's going to make it on the ground level. I'm just going to put it at like negative zero foot. I don't know, six inches. I'm just kind of excavating it down for however low my foundation is going to have to sit. And then I'll say, cool, make it. And what it's done there is if I orbit around, we could just see that now it's taken the ground and just shoved it down. So it's kind of excavated it out in that area. And now my building is not sitting in the ground. And so our next thing that we can look at is a little bit of how to play around with some of the materials, particularly like our interiors and our exteriors of our walls and stuff like that. So right now we just have a generic eight inch wall when we for our outsides. When we did our AutoCAD building, we had that wall with a very specific amount of how thick that wall is, and we had all of these different layers that made up that wall. We can do the same thing here in Revit. We can edit those walls and we can define every single little feature that would exist within them. So if I click on one of the exterior walls, I could do this in any view, no matter what, and then I could come up in here and I could edit its type. Edit type, allows me to make a brand new custom wall or modify the one that I had. What I would always, always recommend is something we are not gonna do, but I always recommend that you duplicate your wall first and then make your changes. The reason why we're not gonna do that is because if I make changes to this eight inch wall, it's going to adjust all of the generic eight inch walls that I have in my project which will be pretty convenient because then when I change just this one singular wall, this wall will change, this wall will change, this one will change. So I don't have to do as much like work necessarily to adjust all of these. Um, so we are just going to edit the structure of just this generic eight inch wall. So when I click on this edit structure, it brings up the assembly of this wall and all of the different layers that are in it. Right now, there's only one layer, just without anything defined to it, and it's just saying it's eight inches thick. If I wanted to build out a wall that was just like the one from our three-room shed, what I'll need to do is insert in additional layers. So to do that, I'm going to click on this little insert button. So I'll bring one, two, three. So that way now I have four layers in total six of these rows are filled in. And then I'm gonna move some of them around within here. So I'm gonna move two layers up using these up buttons, because this is gonna be my siding, my sheathing. And then we have our core boundary, we'll have our stud, and then I'm gonna move one of these layers down and that's gonna be my interior finish. The way they're listed in here is it's always gonna be the outside to the inside of the wall. We can also then adjust the function of what each one of these does. So like for row one, 
I'm going to change its function to be a finish layer because this is going to be like my siding. I'm going to change row two to be my substrate because this is going to be my plywood sheathing. In row four, I'm going to leave that alone as structure because that is going to be my stud. I didn't ask you a question. <laughs> And then in row six, I'm going to change that to be finish number two. This is going to be my gypsum wall board. Is there a difference between finish one and finish two? I have no idea, but I always do finish one on the outside and finish two on the inside. Do they operate differently? I don't know. Will work on their materials last? Um, just because that's kind of the most complicated part of building out a wall assembly. Um, but for their thicknesses, again, we can start putting in actual thicknesses for each of these. So I can put my siding as three quarters of an inch thick. So in row one, I'm going to make its thickness three quarters. You can type decimals in. It will work. For my plywood sheathing, I'm going to do a half inch, and I am just building this off of the wall assembly from AutoCAD. For my stud, I'm going to do five and a half for my two by six. And then in row six, for my interior, my gypsum wall board, I'm going to do a half inch. And so what this is doing is right up here, it's tracking how thick my wall is going to be in total. So it's giving me my, not my estimate, it's giving me my actual amount up here. And then we can also change each one of the categories and how it's going to show up. So like for my gypsum wall board, if I change its material, so in row six, I'm going to click where it says by category. And I'm going to click on the little dot, dot, dot. And since the last thing I used was grass, gypsum wall board is right here next to it, but I could search for, I could search for drywall, it'll pop up. It knows that those are the same two things. I think the only thing that if you do sheetrock, it won't pop up because sheetrock is technically a, like, a company. It's not like just a term, but if I search for gypsum, it'll pop up. One thing that I always like to do then is in this graphics tab, I like to check off use render appearance. What that's just going to do is it's going to take it away from that generic gray and it's going to make it a color so I have that visual cue that I apply to material there. We'll also see too like down here in this cut pattern, it's already put sand in there. Revit knows that drywall is going to show up with this hatch pattern in a section view. So it's already defined that for us. And so then I can just say, okay. The other thing it's starting to do is up here, it's starting to build up an R value and a thermal mass for the wall. Because as we're putting materials in there, it's making those calculations. So then I can get some pretty accurate readings when I go to do like an energy analysis because it knows what it's being made of. For structure, for our two by six is i'm going to again click on by category click on the little dot 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 this one's a little weird because and it could just be be me misinterpreting things if i search for softwood lumber i can find a piece of like dimensional lumber but i don't th if you want to be really accurate with your r value you actually are going to have to search for the joist or the rafter because I'm pretty sure if I just did softwood lumber, it's going to calculate it as if I had a wall of just solid six inch or five and a half inches of wood. So my R value wouldn't be as accurate. This here is a structure wood joist rafter with bat insulation. So it's going to calculate that R value based off of if you were having 16 inches on center and insulation in between. So even though this isn't a rafter, I'm just going to give it the structure of a rafter. For my substrate, I'm going to search for plywood. 
So I'm going to click on where it says by category. I'm going to click on the dot, dot, dot. I'm going to search for plywood sheathing. These ones I don't worry too much about checking off use render appearance or not, because this is never going to show up in a rendering. The renderings are those 3D realistic perspectives. We're not going to see this, this layer of it, but you can check it off if you'd like. And then for my finish, if I click on material and I go into the by category, and I go into the dot, 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 I can pick out a finish color. Um, there isn't a whole lot loaded in by default. So we can search for different ones. What I like to do instead is I often will make kind of my own custom siding. So I'm going to make a new material. So I'm going to click on this little down here and say I want to create a new. And it's called default new material. I'm going to right click on it and rename it siding. And then I want to add let me go into the appearance tab to make sure I do this correctly. I'm going to add a material from the asset library. So I'm going to click on this little dot here, and we have a lot of different materials then that we can load in that are not in here within Revit's library. So if I go into the Autodesk physical library, we have a whole category of just siding, which really only just has two clapboard and horizontal. If I wanted to do stucco, if I wanted stone, roofings, because even here, like I could use this shake, it's in roofing, I could use that as a siding if I had cedar shakes, shingles, I can't say that word. <laughs> We've got plaster, we have just various paints, which especially if I wanted to do different color paints, I'd have to do a lot of like copying this, masonry, we've got all of these different bricks. I really like um, batten board, so I'm going to search up here to see if we have any. -A -T -T. I could have swear. We have clapboard smooth. The batten board would be in there, wouldn't it? I've used it before. Is that what this one is? No. Aha! There is board and batten. So I had to go into the another folder, the appearance. This will let me make this bigger. The appearance library. I went into siding. Here's all of my other sidings because I was like, I know there's way more. And then I found board and batten. And if I want to apply it to this one, I'm just going to double click on it in here. And now I have board and batten siding on there. I'm going to check off use render appearance to apply it to my building. And then I have my now new custom house, custom building. I do have a little gypsum wallboard sitting out here, which is not great, but we'll pretend. One thing I could do to fix that is I could um, use the split surface tool to split it into different pieces, and then I could paint part of it into another material. But I don't want to do too much too soon. We are going to, in the commercial project, we are going to have our own custom walls already built out within the template file. But if you leave everything sitting as generic, then you're going to, when you go to do renderings, you're just going to get a gray blob. To set up a rendering, the first thing we need to do is place a camera. 
Um, I always do my cameras from a floor plan style view. So I'm going to go into the ground floor floor plan. And I'm going to use this little shortcut up here. If I click on the little arrow next to the 3D building, there's a button for camera. Or if I go into the view tab and I click on underneath the word 3D view, there's also a button for the camera there. So two different th options. And when you go to place your camera, you're going to put it where you want the person standing. You click. Where do you want it looking to? You click. And then it places a perspective style view for your camera. You can change this crop to make it a little bit larger or smaller. What I don't recommend doing, if you don't like your camera view, I don't recommend orbiting around in it because then you're going to kind of potentially mess it up. When you place a camera, it's made a new view here in the project browser called 3D Views, and it's now called 3D View 1. If I don't like this view, best bet, delete the camera or delete the view and make another one. So again, I can either click on this little arrow, camera, or I could go here, camera. Where do I want the person standing? Which way do I want them looking? Place my camera. And I usually try to keep this box a little tight around it because of sometimes just big gray blobs popping up. Once I've got a 3D view placed, I can now do a render. So we have two main options for doing a render. We can do one here in Revit, or we can do a render in cloud. Render in cloud requires you to be signed into an Autodesk account, and then they do the render and they email you when it's done and they send it to you. You can also use this option to do panor panoramic 3D renders. So as another kind of to show you quickly, if I go in here and here and here. So this was the first time I made a Revit model of the Eames residence and I did a 3D panoramic render in which I can look around inside my Revit model. I am stuck in this one spot on the floor. I can't move from that one spot, but then I still can at least look around in the building. Whoa, I'm getting a little dizzy. And I can see kind of the building as it's coming together. Um, but that can only be done within the cloud version. If we use just the regular render version here, the little teapot, I think it's a little bigger on your screens. Sure, I'll save my project. What I recommend doing when you go into a render is I recommend you do a draft render first. Sometimes they take a really long time. So to look at like some of like this rendering here took on my computer. I didn't have the best computer at the time, but it took about two and a half, three hours for that to finish up. If I realized then afterwards, oh crud, I forgot to assign materials. Now I've waited three hours to make it and I've got to go back and redo the whole thing and then wait another two and a half or three hours to make it. So don't recommend just doing a high quality rendering off the bat without at least testing it out and looking at it first. You can also turn on this region option because what that region option does is it lets you kind of make just like a small little box where it will only just render this area so we can see if we like it or we have materials first and then we could do like a full on render. We can also change our lighting scheme. If we had interior artificial lights in this building and we wanted to do a nice interior um, rendering, we would definitely want to turn that on. But 
Since we don't have any lights, we're not gonna do that. Artificial lighting takes a lot of time to render. So we're just gonna do an exterior sun only to speed up the process. We can change the background as well if we want. I'm gonna leave the background as few clouds. And I'm gonna put my setting, I'm gonna do a medium one because I know it'll work just fine on my computer. And then I can click render up here at the top. While Revit is rendering, you cannot do anything in the software. You have to wait until it is finished rendering the project. And so this is where like my render is now finished. I would see like, okay, the generic roof looks kind of weird. And then also like the floor is coming through here. So maybe I can fix a little bit of that. I can see a little bit of the siding with the board, with the batten and board, but I can't see a whole lot. So maybe then like I would want to put my quality up a little bit or I would want to go into my floor too and change that so it's not just some weird gray blob there. But while it's sitting running this render, I can't do anything in the software. This used to be the thing that the high schoolers would do all the time is they would come into class and they would run like the most high quality rendering you could ever imagine. So that way they could tell me, I can't do anything, it's rendering. And then I would. Because um, the higher quality you go, the longer this is going to take. I'm actually not even going to let it run the best one because that's just, again, it's going to take quite a bit of time that we don't really need to sit and watch it. The important thing is that when you are done with a render, if you like it, if you're happy with it, so I'll do, I'll do a high. High shouldn't take that long. But if you like it and you're happy with it, you need to either click on save to project or you need to click on export. If you do not click on save to project, if you just say like, that's great, love it, and then close out, you've lost it. You don't have it anymore. Render should also be kind of the very last thing that you do in the project because this is going to become a just standalone image. It is not associated with the linked model. So if I save this rendering and then I decide that I want to go and just get rid of this window here, because like this window looks kind of weird within my model, if I delete it out of my model, it does not get deleted out of the render because the render is a standalone picture. It has no, it's no longer linked with that model. So this should be your very final step for something for a presentation drawing or to show a client. This is not something that would be needed in a set of construction documents. Um, but even here with my high quality one, better be able to see those boards. I can see them a little bit. There's... Maybe if you have a white house, it would show the shadow. It would show the shadow a little bit better. Maybe. There's... Um, one of the very good YouTubers I recommend for Revit stuff, his name is the Revit Kid, and he has his own custom little board and batten wall where essentially he models it where it's then also sticking out when you're looking at it in floor plan and everything. But that is a little more advanced than the second day of using a software. One thing that I sort of dislike about the in-house Revit is, A, the quality is not all too great, particularly like this sky too, like this green, this gray area. In the case of how I had my camera placed, it's not the worst, but I need to make sure I hit save to project and I call it render. Maybe if I can spell, because if I don't save it, I've lost it. I can also export it so I could save it then as like a JPEG and put it into, or a PNG, put it into Photoshop, alter it a little bit more. Especially if you choose a background of just like transparent, you can also put in an image. So if you have a particular skyline you wanna put in the background, I usually would do transparent. I'm just gonna do this one as a medium so it doesn't go as, as slow. And then I'll click on render. 
This one I cannot save to project when I finish it up. So when this one's all done with its medium style, I can't save it to project. I can export it though as a PNG, and then I could put it into Photoshop and put something within that background. So this one just doesn't have anything at all for the sky. Once you've saved it, it's made a new category here in your project browser called renderings, where I have this render. But again, this should be something that you do towards the very end, because if I decide in, that I don't want this window and I delete it out of my model, it's gone from my floor plan, it's gone from my elevation, it's gone from my model, it's even gone from this perspective 3D view but it's here in my render because this is not a model. This is just a picture. So it should be the step that you do once you are know that you're happy with it. There was um, Enscape. So you guys have a tab for Enscape on your Revit. But I think if you guys try to start Enscape, it's going to say that we don't have a license. If I start Enscape, it will work for me because my license is separate from the universities. But Enscape is a rendering software that is linked to the model. And so it has much higher quality assets to it. So like you can even see here, we go down, like the grass is even like moving. Look, I'm a little cat running through the grass. How fantastic, how wonderful. Um, and even then, like just the quality of that batten board looks so much nicer in here. I can move around. Can I get myself out of the grass? There we go. I was like, because that's kind of a weird thing. Um, materials, everything is just a much nicer quality when it comes to something like Enscape. It also has this asset library too, where I can put in components and little details and it's a little bit nicer, a little bit better than the component library that Revit comes with by default. We can even change to the time of day. So if I wanted it to be looking at this building at night, I could see what the building looks like at night. I can place lighting a little bit easier in Enscape compared to in Revit. Um, but I'm not gonna sit and show it in great detail if you guys no longer have access to it and then are not going to have it next year because um, it's not going to be something that you use. They do have a student discount for Enscape if you wanted to put it on a laptop. Um, but I believe it's like $12 a month. Yeah. So for students, for $12.50 a month or $150 a year is actually what they charge you. You could put it on your laptop. We are going to start using next year Twin Motion because Twin Motion will be able to use for free. Twin Motion is similar to what Enscape does. It is a 3D rendering software um, and it is built in to Revit. Well, we have to install it a little bit separate, but it's built into Revit so we can do renderings. I don't know. I don't know if in that they just showed that door open. I don't know if we could do that within Revit. That'd be wonderful if we could, because at the time being now, if you do like rendered walkthroughs, you're just phasing through the door. You don't the door doesn't open like that. Be cool if we could, because it looks kind of weird um, with it. But we can apply those different material assets and it's going to then just really make those renders shine much better than this compared to this, this is kind of, it makes this look real sad now. Um, but it's one of the reasons why they stopped really developing that because of the fact that this is, they were like, other people are doing it better. The really cool thing with stuff like Twin Motion and stuff like Enscape um, is that too, it is linked to the Revit model. So you can see down here, it just opened it up as two tabs. So if I go into my 3D view, and I decide that like, I don't, I want this door to be just a plain single flush door. 
in my Enscape model, it's adjusted and changed. So it's still linked live and it's still moving along with it. Um, I won't spend too much time within it because you don't have the ability. Um, so next class, we'll look at a little bit of how to like set up things like section views and some of this features related to documentation, setting up those construction documents. And then we'll get started on that commercial project together.